I'm going to start a uh, series this morning. I don't know how long it'll go. I don't uh, foresee it being a long series, but I've entitled it, It Ain't Easy Being a Christian. It Ain't Easy Being a Christian. Acts 14, 21. This is Paul and Barnabas, and they're traveling. They're planting churches. They're establishing new churches and winning people to Christ. They're preaching the gospel, and it says in verse 21, after proclaiming the message... Uh, in Derby, this is a city, and then establishing a strong core of disciples, <clears throat> they retraced their steps back through Lystra, then to Iconium, and then to Antioch. And I love verse 22 out of the message. It says, they were putting muscle and sinew in the lives of the disciples, urging them to stick with what they had begun to believe and not quit. Everybody say not quit. not quit. Important. Making it clear to them that it wouldn't be easy. Anyone, they said, anyone signing up for the kingdom of God has to go through plenty of hard times. Anybody signing up for the kingdom of God has to go through plenty of of hard times. And this morning, I want to really talk to you. I want to talk to the soldier in you. I don't want to talk to the sissy. I want to talk to the soldier. I want to address the part of you that wants to possess victory in this Christian walk. I want to talk to the part of you that's not a quitter. All of us have a little bit of quitter in us. You know, we run up against a, a hard time. We hit a brick wall as a Christian. We might oh, quit. I just don't know what's going on. God, what are you doing? To, you know, we, I don't want to talk to the quitter. I want to talk to the winner in you this morning. I want to speak to the part of you that has decided I will not be defeated. You know, nowhere in the Bible... Nowhere in the Bible does it state that following God and living for Jesus is easy. In fact, it actually says the opposite. When we decide to give our life to Christ, we step immediately out into a battlefield. Immediately. We are engaged in a multi-tiered battle. And what I mean by multi-tiered, at least three fronts we're fighting every day. Different enemies, different fronts. Number one, when you choose to live for God, you immediately declare war with the devil. The devil and all of his demonic force immediately declare war on you. Maybe we ought to put it that way. We're, we're sucked into a fight that we didn't even start. But like it or not, you're on that battlefield and the devil now is your enemy. And I got to tell you, that ain't easy because he throws everything he can at you to knock you out of this thing. And you got to be aware of that. You've got to learn to fight that, to be an overcomer, to be victorious. The second front we fight is when you become a Christian, <clears throat> the Bible says that we cannot live according to our fleshly desires as a result we are at war immediately with our carnal nature. So I fight an outside enemy, and then I have one on the inside. This inside enemy is always trying to get me to do the wrong kind of stuff. Deeds of the flesh, argue, envy, hate, jealousy, bitterness, uh, drunkenness, you know, all the things that is listed in 5, Corinthians 5. I mean, the Galatians chapter 5. We're at war every day with a carnal nature that is trying to push you away from God. And that battle will end the day that you physically die and leave this body. But it's, it's a battle we have to fight every day. That's battlefront two. Battleground number three is when we become members, and listen to this, when we become members, citizens of the kingdom of God, immediately... We now oppose and go against the spirit of this world. Um, the world, I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about the world system. The, the society, the government, the thinking, the philosophy, 
The day you become a Christian, you now are in opposition to everything that the world stands for. I'll show you in just a little bit why. Because the Bible tells us the world is under the influence of the evil one. It's a world that is diametrically opposed to God and to righteousness. Colossians 1.9, Paul writes, For this reason, since the day we heard of it, we've not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk, you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for, uh, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of of his beloved son and whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So the day you got saved, you're no longer a member of Satan's kingdom. You're now a member of God's righteous kingdom and that changed everything. Now, uh, it's, this is how we operate in God's kingdom. We have to stand for everything that God stands for. We believe everything that God believes. We take a stance with when God takes a stance. And, and let me give you some examples. For example, uh, on, on the abortion issue, God is pro-life. Do you know that? Nowhere in his kingdom or in his will did he ever plan that, that uh, we would go in and take a baby out of the womb and cut it up into little pieces and extract it. That, that God never, never in a million years... God's pro-life. Now, the reason I say that, that makes you pro-life. You say, well, I don't agree with you. You don't have a choice. If you're in the kingdom, you've got to agree with what God says. You don't like it? Get out. You say, well, I don't, I don't uh, get out if you don't like it because you're in the kingdom where God's the king, God sets the rules, and you and I must go with him. So the world, the world says abortion's okay. Now, I, I have a special place in my heart for those who have experienced that. I'm not condemning you. God can forgive you. I'm just telling you, Christians have to make a stand with God. And if God's pro-life, by crack, is your pro-life. You don't have a choice. You don't get to say, well, I don't agree. It, hey, you're in the kingdom or you're not. And if you're in the kingdom, you have to do what God says. Uh, if God created male and female, and he did, that's what it says in Genesis, then we as Christians can't go along with this silly nonsense in the world that says, well, I'm gender confused. I'm not sure if I'm a boy. Or... No, God says God made a male and a female. The instructions are between your legs. It's easy to read. You do, there is no gender confusion in the kingdom. So, when you, and especially you young people, y'all are the ones that's under pressure. When the world says, hey, it's okay to go through a transfer. No, it's not. The kingdom of God, you, you've got to be a part of the kingdom. You, you, you're with God. Whatever God says, you're, that's right. That's the truth. And, and so we, we immediately go against a world that is trying to push its evil agenda on us. And you you got to battle. you got to fight that stinking spirit every week. Every time we turn on the TV, we got a news, a song. It's all trying to push us to believe like the world believes. And you and I are not a part of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Well, it, it's kind of like this. If God is for Israel, the nation of Israel. Let's just bring it down to a physical illustration. If God's for Israel, guess what? You're for Israel too. You don't get to say, well, I don't like what they, I'm not. A. Hey, listen, if you're in the kingdom, you're for the, you stand for the same things that God stands for. And all these 
all these riots and all this uh, uh, Mideast anti-Jew rallies, listen, that's demonically inspired. And I don't know where you stand on that, but I'm just telling you, you better get into the kingdom and stand where God stands. God said, if you bless Israel, I'll bless you. If you curse Israel, I'll curse you. So either get in or out. You, you don't get a choice in this. If you're in the kingdom, you've got to believe what God believes. The world system hates God. Do you know that? The world system hates good. It hates righteousness. And it hates you. Why? Because you're a part of the kingdom of God. And that really shouldn't come as a big surprise. Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So that's a given. When you choose to serve the Lord, you, you have the world that's your enemy. You have your own flesh that's your enemy. You have the devil and all those demonic forces that your enemy. We go to war immediately when we become a Christian. So why does the world hate God? Why does the world hate us when we take a stand with God? Well, 1 John 14, 5, 14 tells us, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. It says, we know for a fact that we are of God, listen, and the whole world around us lies in the power of the evil one, who is opposing God and his, his precepts. So John wrote to, to his readers, he said, listen, it is a fact that all of you who are born again, we are of God. But then there's a group of people, a whole world system that is opposed to everything that we do. The contemporary English version says it this way, we are certain that we come from God and the rest of the world is under the power of the devil. So you wonder why there's always this big clash between Christianity and the world. Well, 1 John 5 explains it all. We're serving God, and they're serving the devil, and the two cannot meet. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a butt head every time, all the time. God saves us. This is the crazy part. God saves us and then leaves us in a hostile environment to develop us into the kind of people he wants us to be. So being a Christian ain't easy because we're in a hostile situation. Again, remember, you're fighting over here with the devil. You're fighting over here with the flesh. You're fighting over here the world. And our whole daily, our whole lives as a Christian is conflict, conflict, fighting, 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 struggling. God saves us and then leaves us in that mess why? To develop us into the kind of people that he's trying to make us. Make us like Christ. Make us tough. Make us overcomers. Make us more than a conqueror. Make us live in victory. And the only way to do that is in conflict. Now, John 17, 15 says, I do not ask. This is Jesus' prayer to the Father. You know, my, my deal is, Lord, save us and just get us out of this mess. You know, I've heard people pray, oh, I'm a Christian now. I just wish Jesus would come and rescue us. Well, God has a purpose in us in this hostile environment. It ain't easy, but there's purpose to it. He's trying to create in us victorious, victorious people. And it says, I do, Jesus said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. That'd be the easy part. You get saved and whoop, just go to heaven. No, God leaves you here. I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them, protect them, keep them from the evil one. The NIV, Jesus said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. When we read the Bible, most of its content in the New Testament is talking about this conflict that you and I are in every day of our life. Listen to, uh, listen to the words it uses. It uses a word like victory. How many of you know you can't have a victory unless you've had a fight? There's just a lot of Christians don't want to fight. They say, well, I didn't sign up for this. Well, sugar, you're in and you're going to get some. I wish I could say it'd be easy. It's not easy. It's not easy being a Christian. So when the word victory shows up when you're reading your Bible, automatically you know that implies 
you got to fight to have a victory. Victories don't come without a battle. So the battle that you're in right now, remember it's God's will that you come out on top, that you come out victorious. Don't give up. Don't quit. It's hard. I get you. It's not easy being a Christian. And then another word that the Bible uses constantly is overcomer. Overcomer. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you overcome something. You overcome someone. That's what overcome. And then it talks about more than conquerors. <clears throat> well, you've got to be in a fight if you're going to conquer something. And so the whole Bible is laced with this idea that you and I, as Christians, are in a hostile environment fighting on at least three battlefronts, not to mention the hardships that come along the way. Battles and hardships are two different things. Battles are what we're fighting for. Then we've got tribulation. The Bible talks about affliction. I'll explain all this during the series. It talks about uh, hardship, afflictions, endurance, uh, things like that. And, and the whole Bible's written, not that you could read it and come away saying, oh, being a Christian's easy. It's not. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Now, the rewards are certainly worth it. But being a Christian ain't easy. All of those words I just shared with him imply a war, a struggle, a fight. Listen to some of the scriptures. Romans 8, 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. We conquer through him who loved us. 1 John 2, 13. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Do, do you catch my drift? Laced with all the verses, in the, not all of them, but most of them in the Bible is a conflict. It's built in. The Bible saying, hey, it ain't easy, but you can be an overcomer. It ain't easy, but you can have victory. It ain't easy, but you're more than a conqueror. That's what Paul is trying to tell you. It's not easy being a Christian. Seven times in the book of Revelation, those letters were written. The first two and three chapters are letters by Jesus Christ to churches in different locations and different ages. And in every letter... Jesus makes promises to overcomers, people who overcome, not people who start and quit. In the past 20 years, Pastor Sharon and I have seen literally thousands of people come to this altar, give their life to Christ. We pat them on the back. We give them a Bible. We try to get them in a new converts class. We, we try to get them in church. We try to help them get on this journey. Where are things? thousands of people who got saved you're sitting there right now thinking well my cousin my mama got saved but she's not serving God today you see the Bible all the rewards of the scripture are for overcomers not for quitters not those who start and don't finish we're looking for people who will start with Jesus Christ and cross the finish line now you have become an overcomer more than a conqueror victorious. God's looking for that kind of person. There are plenty of quitters around. We don't need quitters. We don't need sissies. We don't need milk toast Christians. We need some soldiers who's going to endure hardship. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, endure hardships to the end. So just already in your mind right now, I don't know how you got talked into this, Hopefully the Holy Spirit convicted you and you got saved. Maybe somebody told you, hey, it's going to be easy. Now that you're a Christian, God solved all your problems. Now you're full of joy and peace. And some of that is true. But what they didn't tell you is that it's going to be hard. There are going to be times you're going to want to throw in the towel. Don't do it. It ain't easy being a Christian. And I'm being honest with you today. Those of you that are newly saved, I'm telling you now, hear me, it's not easy. It's worth it, but it's not easy. 
Some of you that's been saved for a little while, you're just now running into your first hurdle, your first rock wall, your first challenge as a Christian. Hey, now the proof's in the pudding. Anybody can live the Christian life when there's no challenge. But all of a sudden, when you lose your job, when you, cancer knocks on your door, your very first hardship, your affliction, your tribulation, we're going to see what you're made out of. Anybody can serve God when things are going great. It's the people who go through the hardship, the tough times, the test, and the trials. We're going to talk about test. How many of you know this whole thing's a test? <laughs> and if you pass it, yay, we go. If you fail it, just like in school, we have to go through the class again. I had to repeat algebra. I absolutely hated algebra. To this day, I've never used algebra in my life. And I knew that when I started. I looked at that stuff and I said, I'll never use this. And lo and behold, a prophet in the flesh. I have never used it. But I failed it. And guess what? I spent my summer in Christiansburg High School retaking algebra because I failed the test. Well, Christianity is a big test. And I'm going to tell you right now, every day, every day, you face a hardship, a tribulation, an affliction, a challenge. And it'd be so easy to quit. But if you fail, you got to do it all over again. So don't do that. Get on through this thing and let's keep going from glory to glory, level to level, and, and graduate with honors. What do you say? And listen, don't quit. Be an overcomer. Be victorious. Revelation, going through it, I'm not going to take the time to read all these. Revelation 2, 7, Jesus said, He who overcomes, I'm going to grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I'd like to do that. That's cool. I only get to if I overcome. Revelation 2, 11, He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 2, 17, He who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna, And will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone. Revelation 2.26, I'm going to give him authority over the nations. Revelation 3.5, to him who overcomes, not quits, I'm going to dress him in white garments. I'll not erase his name from the book of life, which tells me it is possible. And then I will confess his name before my father and his angels. Revelation 3.12, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation 3.21, to the overcomer, to the overcomer, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. You see, all those promises are for the overcomer. And I got to tell you, to overcome, it ain't easy. There's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of struggling. There's a lot of Times when you just on your knees crying, oh God, I don't know if I can do this. But always remember this, God will never give you anything that you can't bear under. He's made you a promise. So anything you're facing now, you think I can't make it, you can make it. Because God promised you he'd never send anything your way that would crush you and destroy you. So being an overcomer, it's really important in this kingdom. You know, we like to talk about all the blessings and how much fun it is to be a Christian, and we might go over some of that next week. You know, man, God's blessed us, and God's provided healing for us, and he meets our every need, and oh, man, oh, that's great. But there's a flip side to Christianity. Tough. It's tough. And only the tough make it. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession. That's for winners. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith in the conflict with evil Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you were made the good confe- you made the good confession of faith in the presence of many witnesses. I'm going to close now because I got I got to get Rondi in. We've got uh, Johnny's going to sing for us. I just want to tell you, just because you're a Christian, you're not exempt from hardship. And 
going through all of that it might seem a little silly to you, but just remember God's trying to produce in you endurance, patience, victory. You're going to make it. We'll, 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 we'll just stop right here. We'll pick up next week because I'm out of time today. But listen, I want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you today that being a Christian ain't easy, but we can do it. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. I feel sure you're going to make it. Why? Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Would you let me pray with you real quick? Father, thank you for the word today. And Lord, we just kind of got started, but we'll, I ask you to be with us during this entire series as we learn how to delegate and, and handle hardship and tribulation and when times go get rough on us. And Lord, being a Christian ain't easy. You never said it would be, but you said it'd be worth it. And Lord, when we cross that finish line and we, we walk into your eternal kingdom and we have eternal life, It'll all be worth it. So, Father, like Paul and Barnabas, help me to add sinew and muscle to these disciples. I encourage them not to quit, but to hang in there, Lord. No matter what they're going through, you're going to guide and lead us through it and bring us out on the other side. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.